With Heart Rhythm TV in Denver, Colorado, I'm Dan Allianz with another episode of the Ice Image of the Month. This episode, we're going to focus on an often underestimated and underappreciated region, the CTI, or the CTI Isthmus. And we are very happy to be joined today by Dr. Abhishek Deshmukh of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Welcome. Thanks, Dan. Good to see you. So, you know, we're going to start off with, a, with an image. Um, it actually came from a paper we recently published where we annotate the CTI. And I want to just comment a bit about you see the CTI region, you see your inflow, outflow, um, view of and your ice, as well as the right coronary artery and the eustachian bridge. Now, we're going to dive deeper into all this, but this is kind of our home base for how we're going to think about ice imaging as applied to ablation in this region. So, Abhishek, can you comment a bit about ICE, you know, how it helps you uh, work with anatomic variation in the CTI region, and also whether you use ICE for all of your CTI flutters? Thanks, Dan. So I think, you know, majority of the CTI flutters nowadays are done after an AF ablation during which we use an intracardiac echo. So as you're doing more and more AF ablations, we are using more ICE, and that's why majority of the CTI flutters are done with ICE. Having said that, I still use ice for predominantly all my pure CTI flutters. Now, generally you would expect like a CTI to be like a straight line and a smooth highway, but there are definitely going to be more, some potholes at some point. So sometimes these typical flutters become somewhat difficult to ablate from ablation standpoint is that you can encounter pouches, you can encounter prominent pectinate muscles. Sometimes catheter stability can be an issue. There can be a severely dilated right atrium, or there can be proximity to blood vessels, including coronary arteries and small cardiac veins. So these are the kind of situations I think of when, you know, when flutters become difficult to ablate. So I want to you know, take us in, a, in, in our first direction, which is, to be honest, a, I think an area of significant puckering, which is the right coronary artery, the course of the right coronary artery, and ablation of the CTI region. Um, so comment a bit about on the about these floral images that you've uh, given us. Great. So this is, as you can see on the left image, this is an LAO view. You can see the hiss on the septum and a multi-electrode catheter kind of spanning the right atrium going into the coronary sinus. Now, the standard teaching is we get more contact on the tricuspid annulus if you are bending the catheter down and clocking. But sometimes if we clock too aggressively, you can end up in the middle cardiac vein uh, and you may potentially ablate the posterolateral artery, which you are seeing here. So if you go deep inside the middle cardiac vein, you can ablate the posterior descending artery, but not uncommon to ablate the posterolateral artery when you're clocking more towards the septum and inadvertently fall into the uh, coronary sinus. Now, certainly right coronary artery can be injured at multiple places while doing a cavotricuspid isthmus. You can, if you're ablating too lateral, you're going to ablate it kind of in the mid to distal right coronary artery. But if you're more septal, then more chance you might ablate or if falling to the CS, more chance you could inadvertently ablate the posterolateral artery, which obviously can have multiple implications. One would be giving an inferior wall MI and two, the posterolateral artery also supplies the AB node. So if suddenly you get complete heart block during the procedure, if you're doing it in sinus rhythm uh, or with pacing, you have significant prolongation of the AH interval, then think you might be very, very, among one of the reasons could be, you could, could be ablating the posterolateral artery. You can certainly get this because of ganglion uh, uh, effect and basal geris reflex in that area, but something to think about. So I, I wanna actually kind of illustrate this concept because you know, the course of the right coronary artery is very well visualized on ice. So this video came from all places Twitter. And as you can see, they're performing bypass surgery and looking to see where they should bypass the right coronary artery. And they're actually pointing out a very endocardial course. Um, and, and this can vary significantly. So knowing the course of the right coronary artery as it applies to the CTI region can be very helpful and very well visualized with ice. This is a great illustration that, uh, you know, sometimes when we see this right coronary artery on the ice, we always wonder, you know, why and how come we are not creating more inferior wall MIs while doing CTI flutter lines. But again, with a good flow in the right coronary artery, you know, there is a heat sink effect, which could shun away all this convective uh, heating, which might, which happens during radio frequency energy. And that could be a fail safe mechanism for protection of the right coronary artery. But that's not always possible. So, um, so this is another example of, of ice again, now with that home view. 
Um, and you can see the course of the right coronary artery more separately here, okay? And then we gradually move the, ca we, we, counter, uh, we counter clock the catheter and we look at the, the lateral portion of the um, CTI region without the presence of a right coronary artery. And this allowed us to have a safer approach. As you go more and more lateral, the right coronary artery is going to go a little bit away and then you could ablate there. So that is possible, but it's going to be more close when you are on the annulus as you're ablating more septally. So that is one point we, we should be you know, looking for. Okay. Well, thank you for that great discussion. We'll move on to our next topic here. So you, you also commented about small vessels and kind of using ice to, to visualize small cardiac veins. So I'm going to play these images and have you comment on when you saw it, when you've seen these uh, small vessels and how you've used ice to uh, troubleshoot and uh, improve ablation with. Right. So, you know, as a rule, uh, all the arteries are accompanied by a vein. So as you can see, you can even see a small right coronary artery there, but just more towards the CTI, you can see this another structure which has flow, which is the uh, small cardiac vein. And it is very common to see this, these veins also on the cavotricuspid isthmus. These veins, again, due to the flow of blood can act as a heat sink and may prevent you from ablating there. But certainly you can still ablate through that because there is going to be a rim of tissue above the vein, as you can clearly see in that image, where you can kind of compress the catheter. So the flow becomes less in that vein and that you can prevent that heat sink effect and then ablate uh, through that vein and, uh, you know, continue with your ablation. Sometimes uh, when it is not possible to ablate through that, there are also some reports of selectively cannulating that vein to ablate. But, more on, but generally you should be able to get by by ablating on top of the vein and complete the uh, cavotricuspid isthmus line. Now, have you seen conduction tissue within these veins uh, and in needing to or, or close to these veins? Can you comment on that? So you won't get conduction. The vein may have maybe some muscle sleeves as the pulmonary veins have, which could conduct electricity, but you could ablate through that. Rarely, however, you could have inferior displacement of the uh, his bundle, mostly in patients with ostium primum ASD, where you have defect in the AV septum, and then the his can get deflected more inferiorly towards the coronary sinus ostium sometimes, or even more inferiorly on the septal aspect uh, of the tricuspid annulus, inferoseptal aspect of tricuspid annulus, where you could be updating your CTIs. So, you know, rarely that can happen, but something to but you would obviously know from the uh, history of the patient whether there was ostium primum ASD surgery done at some point. So. Understanding the location of these small blood vessels can be very helpful for troubleshooting and knowing where this uh, you know, displacement of conduction tissue could be. Correct, yep, absolutely. Okay, well, let's move on to our next topic. Um, you commented also about pouches and the pectinate muscles also impacting the location of uh, or impacting the CTI. So, you know, I want you to walk us through this case here, which has impressive pouches and how you used ICE to kind of understand and troubleshoot this case. So, you know, as soon as the ICE catheter goes up and we see this kind of a CTI, then we are always wondering, you know, how we are going to tackle it. And you can see a very deep pouch uh, in the middle of the cavotricus pedistimus, if you can point it out. Now, the issue with pouch is that there are two-fold issues. One is ablation in the pouch, and one, if you are not using ice, as you're coming in a straight line, you could miss that pouch completely, and you can ablate both proximal and distal to the pouch without ablating in the pouch. Now, from ablation standpoint, pouches become difficult because the blood flow is slow there. So when you're putting an ablation catheter there, you're suddenly the temperature is going to go up, your impedance is going to go up, there's more risk of a steam pop there and the lesion is going to be smaller if you can't give good power in that location. So if Absolutely. you see So and, and when you when you see that and you see that issue, what what uh, adjustments to your ablation parameters do you make if any? Right. So if you're not using ice and if you suddenly see something like this happening, temperature shooting up, impedance going up, so think there could be a pouch there. So a few ways you can circumvent that is probably ablate lateral to that pouch and see if you can get by. But if you go too lateral, then you might have problems with the pectinate muscles. 
So try to go a little bit lateral, maybe even take a point on your electroanatomical mapping that this is where the pouch is and try to go lateral to it and then ablate. Now generally pouches like to hang out more towards the septum. So coronary sinus ostium has thebacian valve and next to it is this pouch. Uh, and so pouches are going to be more septal. So if you go a little bit lateral, you should be able to get away from the pouches. If however, the nothing works, then you can kind of do circumferential isolation of the pouch and then connect it both uh, anteriorly to the tricuspid annulus and posteriorly to the inferior vena cava. But generally you will find some solution by going a little bit laterally and uh, kind of avoid the pouch and still ablate. Fantastic discussion of the pouches as well as the, the vascular anatomy. Um, thank you very much for joining us. And please stay tuned for the second episode or the second part of this episode where we're gonna focus on Eustachian ridge anatomy, as well as a bit about Epstein flutters and um, bioprosthetic valve. So tune in for the next component.